Good evening and welcome. Tonight, we will discuss a topic of the utmost importance. Stay, stay, watch the entire video. It helps the algorithm. Uh, being not fake in a fake world during a game of pretend with dice. Really? This is what you're talking about? You just did a video on bioessentialism, tackled the tough topic of racism inside of fantasy literature and gaming, but now you want to pivot to something like, Sarah knows that this is the Baron's son, but Glorflack, barbarian of the Calfrog tribe, would have no idea. Look, look, I can't do that every time. Sometimes I just want to talk about the mechanics and stuff that happens at the table, okay? It's not always about the social or controversial topic. Right. Well, get ready for that massive drop in views, buddy. Not like the last one did that well anyway. The average Dungeon Craft video gets more views in two hours than your biggest video got in two months. Hey, his channel is cool too. I mean, he makes fun stuff. People like it. It's inoffensive. It's informative. And by the way, doesn't talking to yourself via voiceover, specifically discussing the thought process of making the video that people are watching, seem a bit... <laughs> If you like this video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. It really helps out and I appreciate every single one of you that does it. It's incredible motivation for me to keep making these videos when I see your comments and likes and see you sharing it around online. So sincerely, thank you. You enter a room thick with the stench of awful. Piles of black bile are in every single corner. Suddenly, a mysterious figure in red robes bursts in, holding a staff in his- I go to the statue of the cherub on the western side of the room, and I grab the arrow from its hand, readying it to shoot at the mysterious robe figure. How do you know about the statue? I didn't mention the statue yet. Uh, my ghostwise halfling, third level druid, circle of the moon, third level barbarian, totem of the bear, would like to go into wild shape and rage. Wait, that means you have a- Yes, it is a raging damage resistant telepathic bear with unarmored defense and the hit points of a bear. And when I lose the hit points of a bear, I'll just wild shape again to regain the hit points of the bear. And then when I lose my hit points again, I'll just be the standard third level druid, third level barbarian. Now let's define some terms. Meta comes from the Greek, where it has a rather simple meaning. It denotes being adjacent to something. In the modern use, it generally means something that is about itself, like a joke about jokes, a discussion about the subject of discussions. A metagame would be then a game about games, but that isn't helpful in this discussion, as we aren't really talking about that in that particular context. In the essay Metagames, Paragames, and Orthogames, A New Vocabulary, the author set out three separate definitions of what we can call metagames. If you look at competitive video game circles, they will often refer to the meta as strategies that are utilized to win the game. This champion, that unit, this gun, etc., etc., as the best one to use in the current meta. This they refer to as orthogaming in the essay. Then there are those achievement hunters, speedrunners, and that like. They're not playing the game just to win or for the fun of it, but playing a separate metagame within the game. That is referred to in the essay as paragaming. Okay, but what does any of this have to do with metagaming in Dungeons & Dragons? I'm getting to it. Now, lastly, they look at the gaming that breaks the fourth wall. Quote, Actions made by a player's character, which makes use of knowledge that the character is not meant to be aware of. This implies metagaming is only meta when it is done by the player. Game masters cannot definitionally engage in the meta act, but they do all the time. And we're going to touch on that later on. That is the metagaming we are discussing today. Conveniently, this is referred to by the authors of the essay as metagaming. The problem that arises even within this definition is there is nuance, as with everything. What comes to your mind when I say metagaming? To a lot of folks, it is something like the players having read the adventure before, or knowing how to make saltpeter for gunpowder. By treating sodium nitrate with potassium chloride, of course. Oh yes, of course. But there is more than just that situation. Tonight, 
We're going to review various forms of metagaming, how the Game Master utilizes it as a standard tool of the trade, and metagaming's place in gaming itself. Let's go on a little journey. I'm going on an adventure! Do people even understand the process? The amount of work that goes into one of these things? The level of research? How do you find time between work, your kids, your spouse, even your other hobbies? When was the last time that you painted a mini? When was the last time that you actually read a book that wasn't related to one of these videos? No one's watching this little vanity project of yours. You got haters faster than you got fans. Why are you even doing these essays? So there's this concept in film discussion, specifically black film criticism, called the impossible white man. This concept, while having a provocative name, is not limited to whites or males at all. The term was coined by the Black Guy Who Tips podcast to describe a trend in action movies after the 1980s surge of the brawny Superman in wildly violent movies, in those Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone movies, some titanic human specimen did laughably outrageous things, and we just accept it because they are basically superhero movies. This started to change change when your basic, average-looking person started being hyper-capable. The impossible white man trope is defined by the following, according to the podcast. One, it cannot be a superhero movie. So Clark Kent is not allowed here. Mild-mannered reporter, but literal alien super being, so no dice. Two, it has to be an action movie. Look, we're not talking about the run-of-the-mill impossible, no Benjamin Button situations here, okay? Number three, they can't die at the end. They generally get through the movie relatively unscathed, where they should have died. A lot. Four, they don't have to be white or male. So Will Smith in Independence Day or Linda Hamilton in Terminator 2? Totally count. These individuals are just everyday people. Sometimes they have something in their backstory that tries to set them apart, a criminal past, some military training, sometimes just being rich. What are your superpowers again? I'm rich. Well, I mean, he's a superhero, but what about this one? Why do I bring this up? Because first level characters are basically regular people. This is a person who is answering the call. Luke Skywalker leaving the moisture farm. I want to come with you to Alder. There's nothing for me here now. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. But how many times do you see players agonizing over every little detail of their character, trying to maximize their power and minimize their weaknesses for combat? This person basically emerges from the farm as a certified wrecking ball. The third level character is the most basic professional. Yet some of these builds could wipe entire rooms of goons. Some folks are really obsessed with these types of characters. There are entire channels devoted to hyper-specific power builds. This is the player manipulating the game. They're playing a game within the game of designing the hyper-proficient character. That's metagaming. It's also wonderful. Look, this gamer is getting their fun out of the game. They love crunching the numbers and playing out the scenarios. Forming a character is not a zero-sum game. You don't lose role-playing points when you min-max a character for combat. They don't lose personality by gaining an attack bonus. Even if the characters have no personality whatsoever, and we may examine that a little later. Bear with me. You used to do Dungeon Master advice videos. Drop in the flood, really. Still, no one thinks this much about games. And those that do don't like your silly videos. And your voice? You'd be better off reading a phone book. Might help some folks go to sleep. As a game master, we met a game all the time. It's actually expected for us to do so. I would go so far as to say that to be a good game master, you must met a game. <laughs> and utilize the fact that your players will met a game. So the very earliest D&D games 
were not what you would call especially story heavy. The game was derived from a tabletop war game called Chainmail. In fact, the first edition of the rules directly references this war game, and you could not play it if you did not also own a copy of it. That bleeds into the very DNA of original D&D. The adversarial DM idea didn't just spawn from nowhere. The dungeon master literally created the dungeon for the players to conquer. Many early dungeons were designed to kill players. In fact, Tomb of Horrors explicitly was designed to humble players who felt that they had invincible characters. But as the role of the dungeon master evolved to more of a storyteller, game masters started engaging with the players in subtle ways. You may be using this without even knowing it. As noted in Game Masters in Interactive Story, there are actions that you can take that almost require players to metagame. This goes back to the basic Skinnerian operant conditioning. For instance, one of the mentioned tools is the lack of reward. The players investigate something specific, roll the dice, and the game master responds, you don't find anything useful. Nothing happened from taking that action. Therefore, your players will assume that it was the wrong action. Players will then stop pursuing that course of action. Now, watch any movie about investigating anything. Dead ends don't stop the investigation. Many times, dead ends make the investigators strive to do more or try to exhaust all avenues to eliminate different possibilities. Conversely, the granting of reward promotes behavior the game master wants. That little gesture can give the player a little dopamine hit. Here's a little chocolate with almonds. The players don't think of it as, I'm making the GM happy. They think of it as, I did something right. As Robert Ciardini points out in his book, Influence, Science, and Practice, the more we like someone, the more we're likely to comply with that person's requests, either explicitly or implicitly. So assuming you like your game master, and that's a bit of a stretch, you will do what she hints for you to do. I put the bugbear in there for a reason, Quenjay. Talk to him, talk to him, talk to him. That's not metagaming. My character understands that being rewarded means they're on the right track. Yeah, that's fair. But game masters use that to have the players engage in the activity that the character might not. Like most people would not look to engage in violence for violence sake. But if you have a party that needs to level up on a journey, you may present various random encounters with wilderness creatures just to give them something to fight. How many hikers, even armed hikers, would see a bear off in the distance and then decide to go hunt it? The adventuring party will generally see it and decide that, hey, today's the day the barbarian gets her bear pelt hood. The paper further states that it is crucial for game masters to understand their players' needs and desires. Quote, a good game master will try to second guess the players by their individual natures, at least enough to anticipate their actions. All metagame leading techniques are derived from the art of trying to predict human actions. But many game masters try to predict the actions of their specific players rather than simply players in general. It is found in the very nature of how we describe a room during an adventure. Smoke emanates from a bowl in front of the wizard. Various herbs and bottles lay in front of them as they look up at the intruders. Versus, smoke emanates from a bowl in front of the wizard. Various herbs and bottles lay in front of them, including one of a sickly red-colored liquid with clumps inside of an unnerving quality. If you're anything like the groups I've played with, someone is drinking that poison mentioned in the second description. It is the role-playing equivalent of Chekhov's gun. Anton Chekhov was a Russian playwright who stated that the elements of a story must be essential to keep the story tight and lacking unnecessary parts to it. Specifically, in a letter to Alexander Semenovich Lazarev, he stated, One must never place a loaded rifle on the stage if it isn't going to go off. It is wrong to make promises you don't mean to keep. In the visual mediums, movies, plays, and television, it's easy to hide something in plain sight. I think of something like The Sixth Sense, which had little visual cues all over. Or something like A Beautiful Mind, which had hints that some people in John Nash's life 
we're not real. It is easy to miss these things, especially if we aren't paying attention. But in the imagined world of role-playing games, the onus is on the game master to provide the details of the world. When you are using your words to describe the world, your players cannot help but to try to interpret the words that the game master is using to describe that world. As a game master, it's reckless not to think about how your words will be interpreted. So the only way to really try to counteract unintentional misunderstanding is to try to anticipate how the players will metagame your descriptions. But it isn't just a glaring yellow exclamation point you paint with your words above the room's MacGuffin. It's also the situations in general. When you describe anything, it is with the intent to provoke emotion. But it isn't the character you are describing to. You are also inherently talking to the player directly. You are altering the gaming experience to affect the player's reaction. Now this paper quotes Robin Law, designer of the Dying Earth role-playing game. Side note, the book series by Jack Vance called Dying Earth is where we get the old magic system for Dungeons & Dragons, where the wizard memorizes a spell and then forgets it once it's used. I always found that system to be incredibly cool. As saying, failure is usually boring. It is the credible but unrealized threat of failure that is interesting. To stalwart adventurers fighting to save the multiverse, repeated failure may not dissuade them. Faced with the end of their world's existence, they will fight to the last breath. But a player trying to have fun during their Tuesday night might just nope out of your game. Forget this universe. I could just play Mountain Blade Bannerlord instead. I love that game. Quitting the game that isn't fun is the biggest form of metagaming. But... It isn't usually the player's fault that they chose to do it. So what do we do? We alter the fail states to provide little victories for the player. Feed them some candy. But Matt Colville keeps saying verisimilitude. So role-playing games are a lot like the Matrix. Hola, Paella here. I'm editing this video. I'm sorry, but uh, Kimchi just watched the entire Matrix trilogy again before writing this part of the video. Like, it's a good movie series and all, but come on. It's a bit of a stretch to compare playing a tabletop game with friends to an AI conquering humanity and turning us all into batteries as we live our lives in some sort of simulation. Plus, this is like the second video in a row where he mentions the Matrix. I mean, we all love Keanu and everything, but come on, let's pull back from the Matrix, okay? Maybe talk about uh, Lionel Messi moving to PSG or something. So everyone should know about the Matrix movies at this point. Humans living in a computer simulation created by artificial intelligence. And some folks are trying to free humanity from the virtual prison. L look, at this point, it's over 20 years old. Time is a predator stalking you. So I hope that you all had the opportunity to watch it so I'm not spoiling anything for you. In the movie, Agent Smith talks about how the first Matrix was a disaster because it was too perfect. Humanity rejected the simulation because they could sense that it wasn't real because of its perfection. Now, we can dive into the rabbit hole about how machines may have made other errors as they don't have a real clear understanding of the human psyche or what would actually be perfection for us or that the issues that they think caused the disaster weren't actually the problem. Correlation is not causation. But let's take this at face value. What the machines are basically talking about is verisimilitude. Verisimilitude, aside from being a word that I can't spell the first time, any time that I try to type it to save my life, when referring to a fictional work is actually one of two things. There's actual cultural verisimilitude, which is the plausibility of a work of fiction within the confines of the real world in our history, and genre verisimilitude, which is the plausibility of the fantasy world in the text of the fantasy. This is key, as genre verisimilitude is dependent upon the author more than things in our real world. But what about in the context of metagaming? One of the complaints of the players who is metagaming is that they're using knowledge outside of the game. In a sense, the player is breaking the genre verisimilitude. The solution is trying to have the player be the character. Sarah Lynn Bowman refers to this as immersionism. When a player focuses on thinking and feeling as a character in that moment. Now, she points out that while this may seem a lofty goal, in many people's opinions, the loftiest goal in role-playing games, it can cause problems for what is actually the loftiest goal in role-playing games. Fun! This isn't acting. 
That's a different discipline. We're playing a game here. It isn't hard to think about a situation where a character's motivated actions disrupt the entire game, ruins someone's fun, messes with the group dynamic, or fractures the much more important out-of-game boundaries of acceptable behavior. Look, we've all heard horror stories of someone who is just doing what my character would do. I've had groups break up because someone was doing that. And sometimes it's serious. See my video on consent. Sometimes it's just annoying. Your character may be fully realized and incredibly plausible in the created world. Everything makes sense. But if they're annoying, or no fun to play with at the table, none of that really matters. And it may not be realistic in the setting for the other characters to abandon that character, or fireball them in their sleep. But it might happen. John Wick. No, not that John Wick, but hey, can we give it up for Keanu? Noted game designer and creator of Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah, I know. And Seventh C called immersionist play incredibly selfish. Immersion should only be used to enhance the story or contribute to the enjoyment of others. But therein lies the question. If you alter your character's behavior to accommodate fun, isn't that metagaming? You are using your outside knowledge that the character is not aware of what is fun for your group to change how your character behaves in the fictional world. That is the very definition of metagaming, isn't it? I think it was. Let's check the clip. Actions made by a player's character which makes use of knowledge that the character is not meant to be aware of. Yep. That's metagaming. And if you don't do that metagaming at my table, you won't be at my table that long. Let's get into the deep cut here. This is the part of the video that some of you may be thinking I'm far into the weeds talking about. But this is the part that I think most of my loyal viewers are really coming here for. Here's a postulate for you. It is impossible not to metagame. When you are playing a role-playing game, you're actually assuming a triplex of roles. You are the persona, the player, and the character. Role-playing games can be understood, described, and explained as an activity that exists in the unique interstices between these three aspects of you. The persona is the grouping of identities that make up who you are, however you define yourself. This could be as complex as relating your various roles in your life, from your job, your relationship, to all the accumulated knowledge that you have from whatever means that you have received it. Whatever roles you play, in that grand RPG called life. This is the you that knows that there are eight planets in the solar system. Pluto! To the fact that a water molecule is comprised of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. To the fact that the majority of South Korean presidents have been jailed for corruption. Or that the majority of American presidents probably should have been jailed as well, but we lack the national courage to do so. It is you, inescapably, irrevocably, inseparably. The player is the part of the person who knows the game. The actual mechanics that the game designers put into the game. When to roll dice if there are dice to roll at all. This is like the folks who are jacking into the Matrix. They know it's a simulation. They understand and can manipulate the program which allows them to do amazing things. That is you. Whether you flex that brain muscle is up to you, but you know how to do it. The character is the actual person inside of the game world. Some people like to think of this person as a fully created and fleshed out individual in their minds. Look up any writing chat group, and you will see authors talking about how their characters surprise them and do things they would never have thought of. I don't personally subscribe to this train of thought. I mean, when you think of what the characters would say or do, you literally thought of it in your mind. At least that's how it is to me. Different people's brains work differently, so for all I know, their brains could just operate differently than mine. These characters may not have the same knowledge as the persona. They live in a different world, sometimes a wildly different world. Their base of knowledge is fundamentally different than yours. In certain circumstances, the things that they know are so outside of your knowledge in the real world that you wouldn't even know that they would know this type of thing. Imagine, your game master doesn't actually know all the details of the world in her head. She may not have thought of the various names of currency, or what they refer to the phases of the moon as, or the proper etiquette on how to eat certain foods for each culture, and what utensils are used. And if she doesn't know, and it's her world, then you definitely don't know. We're basically engaging in impromptu acting. The only restraints are what the group decides is okay, which is 
meta in and of itself. The collective group uses its outside knowledge of the world presented in the game and their knowledge in the real world to establish the spoken or unspoken rules for what is or is not allowed for the characters to do, say, or know within that shared game world. Well, that sentence was a whole roller coaster. <laughs> do you see the fallacy here? The very act of the group deciding what is metagaming is itself metagaming. It presents the artificial moral quandary. Should the player act upon the solution that is known to the player even if it's not known to the character? It's artificial because while we use these philosophical wordings and arguments to discuss the separation of the persona, player, and character, we all know the vital and essential truth of the matter. They're the same person. Waskell discussed in their paper that participants in a role-playing game must actively establish symbolic borders between these three aspects of themselves to assume the proper role for the proper circumstances. It is a concept called border work. The issue with that is that border work is a concept to examine the dynamics of interpersonal relationships, not intrapersonal relationships. But as they continue, they argue that the difference is purely conceptual. That being said, the borders between these roles are incredibly porous. As a player in their own study advised, you can't say that your PC will never be an extension of yourself because you are playing your character. If you think your character is supposed to act that way or this way, it's still just your perception, because no one else can take that same character and play it totally the same. In other words, if that character existed completely separate from you, then anyone could make the same choice every time. Clearly our interpretation of the character, which is inherently formed by our outside of the game self, the persona, molds that character. That is still metagaming. Consider how many different actors have played Romeo and Juliet. Even with the same two actors, each performance is different. The interpretations change every time. Otherwise, why bother with different versions of the play? Those actors infuse those characters with themselves. Their outside knowledge affects their performance of those characters. That's the beauty. That's where art comes from. This game is a shared dream. A lucid dream, collectively formed. To play a game is to make a dream come true. I recently posed the question on Twitter about metagaming. The answers were varied, as you might imagine. Some vehemently against it, some if it could be explained, were okay with it, some rolling with it as long as the fun continued. Look, I'm not here to dictate styles of play to you. People assume that if you say something online, it's a mandate or manifesto on how people should play the game. I'm not in the business of doing that. All I'm trying to do is to dive deeper into the topic. But personally, I find the separation to be mostly impossible. Everyone likes to bring up the glaring examples, but as with many things, it's a matter of consent. All groups have metagaming. It's impossible to erase, and for some things, it would be terrible to erase. Erasing all possible metagaming would also eliminate Game Master's tools, consent forms for your players for what they do and do not want for your game. In short, it would make the game less fun. What your group just needs to agree on is what level of metagaming is okay for your table. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you got to this point, I really appreciate it. I know it doesn't seem like much, but every time that you share the video, like, comment down below, or hit the subscribe button, it really helps me out. And it's an incredible motivator for me to continue making these videos for you, because I have such fun doing it. You can also check me out on Twitch, where I stream every Tuesday and Saturday nights at 9.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I have people from the TTRPG community come on and we have discussions about various topics pertaining to the game inside and out. So if you like the type of content that you get from these videos, you'd probably like that as well. Additionally, you can follow me on Twitter at Legal Kimchi, where you can get announcements for when I'm going live, or when a new video gets posted to keep you up to date about what's happening. Again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Okay. It's done.